Welcome to another episode of The Rest is Politics with me, Alistair Campbell. And me, Rory Stewart. Now, you may have heard Rory and I appeared live in Blackpool at the weekend on the stage of the Winter Gardens, and many, many thanks to the 2,200 people who made it there in spite of the rail strike. And I think we had a reasonably good time, Rory. It was amazing. Winter Gardens, incredible historical place. People who haven't been there, Blackpool was the kind of, um, I guess it was the Victorian Las Vegas, first city in the world to be fully electrified. And we were there on the stage with, you know, where Bob Monkhouse and Tony Hancock and Max Miller, the cheeky chappy, had been in a time. I know it was legendary. Thank you, everybody who came. And anyway, we now have another live date in the diary to tell you about. It's a fair way off, but might as well get you a bit in early. It's in London at the Palladium, Wednesday, March 22. Now, there are 2,286 seats available, but 700 have been reserved for subscribers to The Rest is Politics Plus. For those of you who don't know, you can support the show and get all the pods without adverts for £3.49 a month by going to therestispolitics.com. Tickets for members are on sale today, that's Wednesday from 9am, and 700, as I say, have been reserved for supporters of the show, and we'll email all members the link for tickets. They then go on general sale from Friday, and we'll tweet the link on Friday morning. We expect it to sell out because Rory and I are incredibly popular. So if you're keen to come, do get your acts together quickly. And we hope to see lots of you there. And, and I guess the next thing is we've got to play the Brighton Pavilion. I mean, we've, we, if we're really going down the music hall route, I'm going to become, <laughs> the, given that I know nothing about football, I'm going to become the pod's leading expert on the stars of the 1920s music hall stage. <laughs> I was, you, were, you, were, you were far too excited by seeing those po- old posters of Bruce. Forsyth when he was young and oh, uh, I loved it. The dressing rooms were uh, left something to be desired, but you know, I think we've uh, we've been in a few pretty grim dressing rooms in our time. Presumably, nobody now really remembers Max Miller, the cheeky chappy. Does do people still remember Harry Lauder? Is he still a big figure? I think a certain fairly old Scottish person <laughs> will remember <laughs> Harry Lauder, but it is extraordinary that these names how they some endure forever. You didn't mention George Formby, of course, in your the list you, you gave there, but I think Blackpool, they definitely remember him. And it was nice to see that statue of Morecambe and Wise inside the Winter Gardens as well. And, and as you pointed out, you're definitely Wise. <laughs> yeah, the trouble with him is Wise is a lot smaller than Morecambe, and I'm a lot bigger than you as, you, as you kept saying. By the way, you didn't have to keep saying it at a live show, Rory, because it was perfectly obvious. I thought the hi- my highlight of the, the Blackpool show was when your headset was playing up and you had to go off the stage and I was pretending to be you it was and, amazing uh, i loved your old etonian accent that was really impressive thank you and but 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 the audience loved it when my rory stewart impersonation uh, agreed with alistair that austerity was a complete and total disaster the audience went wild at that i hope you got the message rory i did i did and i'm waiting also to see you do your ventriloquist act at the at the palladium <laughs> well shall we get on with the rest of the show as it were yes very good okay Go on, tell us, what have we we got on today? Well, I think we have seen a pretty dramatic series of events in Ukraine, which we should talk about. And then from war to Liz Truss's attempted truce, there's the terrifying thought for Tory MPs that Liz Truss is about to go on a charm offensive. I think we should discuss what a Liz Truss charm offensive looks like. We've got the SNP conference going on and Nicola Sturgeon talking about detesting Tories. You're in North Africa. And I know you want to talk about Libya in particular. And I think we should talk about Liz Truss's obsession with moving our embassy in Israel to Jerusalem, against which church leaders in the UK now appear to be uniting against. So there's, as ever, a lot going on. But let's start with that. I mean, you 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 work for Liz Truss. You know Liz Truss. What does a Liz Truss charm offensive look like? And also, isn't it a bit odd? I mean, normally, prime ministers, struggling prime ministers go on charm offensive tours of the tea rooms when they've been there about eight, nine, ten years and people are getting fed up of them. This is happening within weeks. It's amazing, isn't it? I mean, I think that's the first really big fact because it's never been seen before in British politics. The Tory party is famously ruthless. One of the reasons it's the oldest party in 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 the world, I think now, most successful party in the world, is that it's very ruthless about getting rid of its leaders. But usually it gives them a year or so before it starts turning on them. Mm. And there's meant to be a honeymoon period. You're meant to come in and get your first 100 days at least where everybody gets behind you. And the Tory party, before it turns on you, usually is fiercely loyal. So you would have expected in her first few weeks 
MPs desperately out defending her, championing her program, getting behind her, sitting on their tongues, the whips flexing their muscles in case anybody was grumbling. And that's very normal. I remember David Cameron coming in in 2010 and being in the 1922 committee meeting. That's the meeting of all the, the conservative MPs in parliament. We sit in this huge wooden room and everybody bangs on the desk. And I saw all the right of the party, all the Brexiteers who detested David Cameron, swallowing their resentment and banging mm. on the desk and cheering and putting themselves behind. So basically, that's what you'd expect. And this trust has got nothing of that. I mean, I think Dozens of conservative MPs have now come out publicly on Twitter attacking her budget. And people like Michael Gove and Grant Shapps, who are not really at the far ideological edge of the party, I mean, maybe Michael Gove a bit more than Grant Shapps, but are basically ambitious, competent, focused ministers turned on her almost immediately. And that I've never seen before. I mean, I think the, the a couple of things on Grant Shapps. I read a piece in one of the papers yesterday that um, he now has, a, he was showing everybody a, a spreadsheet on his new smartphone, some ridiculously expensive phone that he's got, where he's keeping note and on a spreadsheet of all the different MPs who have been critical. The other thing that was pathetic yesterday, that you had a succession, a whole gaggle of cabinet ministers writing in all the right-wing rags about how we have to stand by Liz. But these are people that we know are going around saying that she's terrible. Penny Morden was one of the pieces. And so I just think that they're trapped in this very, very old way of doing politics. They think it's all about getting your message out through the papers that support you. And she hasn't, it doesn't strike me that she's got authority. I was talking to one Tory MP over the weekend and I said, well, what's going to happen when you all go back to Parliament? I mean, are the whip's going to get a grip or what's going to go on? And he said, well, they've lost any authority and they've lost any right to tell us what to do because she, Truss and Kwarteng, have gifted the opposition a 30-point lead in the polls. Once you've done that in politics, you lose all credibility. And he said she can't get it back. The fundamental thing, which... <laughs> is at the bottom of all of this, is the fact that the Conservative Party is now 30 points behind in the polls. That, that means that at the moment, the opinion polls are suggesting more than half the British population would vote Labour, and about 20% would vote Conservative. And this is something which I don't think has ever been seen historically. I mean, I stand to be corrected by some pollster, but this is off the scales. I think at the depths of Mucklefoot, he wasn't ever that far behind. And I don't think the Conservatives have ever been that far behind in world history. No, we, we had a poll lead in the 30s at one point, but I remember getting, it was a Telegraph poll, and I remember dismissing it at the time as a rogue poll because I was worried it would sort of breed massive complacency inside the Labour Party. I do, if I were Labour, I would not take these polls too seriously. I think they're a reflection of a, a cataclysmic single event. But the worry from the Tories is, we talked about this the other day, is the extent to which it becomes defining, that people think that is all they remember of her. Now, the reason I found the whole concept of the charm offensive kind of ridiculous is, you all know better than I, but she doesn't strike me as having much of that empathy that goes with being charming. And the other thing, she's shown, we talked about the Millwall strategy, you know, no, no one likes us, we don't care. And okay, they're now sort of briefing out that it's a signal of their intent to try to heal divisions, that she's appointing Greg Hands to replace this guy who apparently touched up some bloke in a bar in Birmingham and has been kicked out, who's, by the way, on Boris Johnson's resignation honours list for a knighthood, lovely people. But she sort of doesn't strike me as somebody who can charm people over like that. Remember, Eddie Rama talked about Angela Merkel being uncharmable. I think trust strikes me as being incapable of charming. Well, I think, I think her, she is... If face to face, she can be very lively, very smiley. I mean, you, you will have seen pictures of her with the Israeli prime minister putting her arm around him, laughing. She can be very lively, make a lot of jokes one on one. I think she struggles a bit on a public stage. She becomes a bit stiff and wooden. She's very much grew up in the early days of the Cameron message discipline, which meant being trained to just repeat the same message again and again. But the most dramatic example of that, of course, we've seen in recent months was the amazing performance by Nadim Zahawi attacking you, where he kept saying in word for word, um, we shouldn't be egged on by people like Alistair Campbell. And word for word, I think in seven interviews, the same 
phrases, including the egg, kept appearing, as well as the Alistair Campbell. Well, and and I, every time he said it, I hadn't seen it. I mean, fair play. We got a question last week, I think it was, why do we never thank the team behind the rest is politics. So let's thank them now. Uh, Nicole, Callum, Jack, Dom and Tony. I'm putting them in the reverse order that they would expect to be because that's the kind of thing I do. But I th- I think that the, one of the best things, that because I've not seen that. We played that film at Blackpool. Of Literally, people can see it on social media, back to back, those interviews. And of course, every time he said, you know, the, we, we need to understand the people egging us on to tear ourselves to bits, our people like Alistair Campbell. I, of course, he does slightly look like an egg. And it's, it's sort of, I kept thinking as <laughs> clip by clip that he was, he was turning into an egg. And then at the weekend, who was it? Of course, the climax to the film is that 24 hours after he is accusing me of bringing about the defenestration of Boris Johnson, he writes a letter to Boris Johnson saying it's time to go. And who was it across the airwaves yesterday doing the media round? Defending Liz Truss and saying she was marvellous and we should all get behind her, Nadeem Zahawi. Well, so to, just to put this in context, the I can't remember, what was the Labour lead going in in 97? Because at the moment, to put it in context, Conservative Party won 365 seats at the 2019 general election. Um, now, this stands at 358 now because there have been by-election defeats mm-hmm. in Cheshire and Amersham, North Shropshire, Wakefield, Tiverton and Honiton. Conservative gain in Hartlepool, Chris Wakeford defected to Labour. And I think we currently have three MPs currently suspended and sitting as independents. Conservatives have three MPs sitting as independents due to allegations of sexual misconduct. But if you go back to 97, Labour got 418 seats and the Conservatives only 165. So that's, that would mean going from 358 at the moment down to 165. That means two thirds of the MPs would have lost their seats if it had been the lead that Labour had had in 97. But of course, the lead that Keir Starmer's got at the moment, and you've put all these caveats around it, but the reason the Conservative MPs are terrified is the lead theoretically at the moment would mean they drop down from 358 down to about 80 members. And it's worse than that because it's not just, for this trust, it's worse than that because it's not just that a lot of MPs are worried about losing their seats. We had an interesting question I'd like to explore about what MPs do after they leave Parliament and why that's a problem. And we can maybe investigate that a bit. But it's also that there are many MPs who are just so angry with the direction the Conservative Party's gone in that they're just going to leave. And and therefore, the whips have no control over them. I mean, as I said on the stage at Blackpool the other night, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed at how many MPs, some of whom I know well, some of whom I barely know at all, sort of send me messages and get in touch with me. And I was in discussion by text with one of them who actually said that, you know, <laughs> she said this to me, thanks for all you do to call this fucking shit show out. Yeah. And I said, well, wh- and I said, what are you going to do? And he said, we're going to keep making a change policy until she goes. It, it's amazing. I mean, I'm, I'm obviously hearing from Tory MPs all the time. So people who are sitting in the House of Commons, texting, calling, emailing, Zooming. And I've never, never, ever seen them so angry. And it, it's fascinating for me because I thought that given that we've been very critical of Liz Truss and Boris Johnson, I would have thought that many of them would get a bit fed up with me and think, this isn't fair. You're an ex-conservative MP. Why are you spending your whole time criticizing the government? But what I've discovered is that they feel really betrayed. They felt betrayed, many of them, about the Northern Ireland Protocol and the irresponsibility of that. They were disgusted by the drop in the top rate of tax. They cannot believe the fiscal incompetence. And, And that's another thing that, very weirdly, the obviously the only justification for austerity was a commitment to trying to reduce the deficit, reduce the deficit and the debt. And the argument at the time, which the Conservatives made when I was in government from 2010 to 2019, and it was a very, very painful argument, very unpopular, you deeply disagreed with it, Labour deeply disagreed, was that we needed to reduce the deficit or the debt. And if we didn't, we'd lose the confidence of the markets. And that if the markets, because we're not the world's reserve currency like the United States, we're not Japan, which owes money to itself, We're a country very open to global financial markets. And therefore, we had to reduce the deficit debt, stop the borrowing, cut spending in order to balance the books. And basically what Boris Johnson mildly, but much more dramatically, Liz Russ, Trust and Quasi Quarting have done is to come in and say, essentially, borrowing and debt doesn't matter. We don't think the markets will be frightened by getting the borrowing and spending out of control. And they've been proved triumphantly wrong. The markets Mm. were terrified by what they did, in a sense, vindicating conservatives who've been arguing that we need to be responsible about our spending and borrowing 
for mm. the last for the last 10 years. The other thing, of course, though, is that this is often when you're talking about budgets and fiscal rules and office of budget responsibility. And a lot of this stuff just kind of flies over people's head. But this this is eaten in to everyone because of the, the issue of mortgages. One of the MPs I was talking to was telling me about a neighbor of his who had literally just had to, you know, yank up his, his mortgage by yeah. several hundred pounds a month. And I, another one I spoke to who was, you know, when you, when, um, when you ask even Tories now, when you say to them, hand on heart, what do you think would be better for the country right now, Keir Starmer leading a Labour government or Liz Truss leading this Conservative government? And they just shrug their shoulders. And the other thing that's happened, Rory, we talked to Blackpool about the sort of the divides that have opened in the, in the Conservative Party. And the truth is that even the sort of nationalist populists are not really libertarians in the way that Liz Truss has decided to be. So you've got the One Nation Tories, like people like you, you've got the national populists, and then you've only got the, the sort of true libertarians left. And the other thing that came through that utterly disgusted people, and I think we should maybe at some point have a little discussion about whether Nicola Sturgeon was right to say that she detests Tories, because I know exactly what she means, but was Suella Braverman saying that her dream was to see a plane for a picture on the Daily Telegraph of a plane full of refugees and asylum seekers being flown to Rwanda. I think a lot of Tories were utterly disgusted by that. And another thing which we've talked about, maybe we should go to the break soon, but another thing we've talked about, which is changing and will be worrying Downing Street a lot, is that you've put a lot of emphasis on the support of the right-wing press for the Conservative government. But you will have seen on Saturday that the entire front page of the Daily Telegraph was dedicated to the Conservative MP being suspended for allegations of groping people at the conference. Full front and centre photograph, headline, front page that the Daily Mail is now running, blistering stuff, attacking the way in which the government handled the procurement of the COVID vaccine. Oh, is this the Kate Bingham yeah, book? Sarah, like, so, mm. Yeah, to remind people, Kate Bingham came in to lead the vaccine task force and did a very good job. It was one of the only real successes of the Boris Johnson government was getting those vaccines bought very, very quickly and very ruthlessly. But what has been revealed in her forthcoming book, which has been serialized in the mail, is just the unbelievable ways from about 15 different directions in which government made it almost impossible for her to do her job. And some of that is the fault of people like Matt Hancock, who she's very, very critical of, trying to play games and humiliate her at meetings. Some of it is the fault of incredibly slow civil service processes, national audit office processes, some of which, when she describes them in detail, are completely mad. I mean, it, it's a, and, and 120 comms officers in a single government department all briefing out stuff, which is at odds with what comms directors and other departments are saying. Well, as you know, I, I'm no fan of the Daily Mail, and I only read it because you said you wanted to talk about it, but I did read it. And I, I agree with you, it was utterly excoriating. And I know that Hancock and Johnson will want to blame the civil service. I actually do think that what came through was a shocking lack of grip and leadership at the ministerial level. And I think she was being, she was very not being polite about Hancock, but I think she was trying to remain reasonably polite about Johnson. But I hope that this COVID inquiry, when it's, which is now finally underway, I hope that the people who give evidence to it are as frank as she appears to be. And it's not just sort of, you know, trying to promote a book, because what came through to me was the chronic gap between the picture of the government management that was being displayed by everybody, including Kate Bingham, by the way, but certainly by Johnson and Hancock and Sunak and all the rest of them, and the reality of what was going on, which some of us were saying at the time felt like it was being utterly mismanaged. Yeah. Well, it's, it's also fascinating on journalism. I mean, we need to maybe do more on this and maybe see if we can persuade Kate Bingham to come on the show, because we're always having a go at the right-wing media. She argues very, very plausibly that The Guardian really did her over and wrote a dozen unbelievably unfair articles attacking her, which they've made no attempt to retract. So that, that will be interesting to investigate. And were they being fed out by these these sort of people around some of the ministers? Because that's the other thing I wondered. It does seem that there was a this thing about communications, and I felt quite pleased really, because I think the one thing that was never said about us was that we didn't have a grip of the communications machine. We had a pretty good grip. But you do get the sense of these... Of <laughs> no, these nobody ministers. accused you of not having no. a grip of the communications <laughs> machine. <laughs> but you do get a sense that these ministers 
and particularly the spads around them, all they think they think that all politics is about the communications and all government is about the communications. And I've often said that the communications actually is about between 10, 15, 20%. The important stuff is actually what you're doing and how you grip it. And they're, they're all surrounded by these sort of 20, 30 somethings who wander around the place thinking it's all just about sort of getting nice headlines in the Express. Well, honestly, there's no way you don't get a nice headline in the Daily Express if you're the Prime Minister, um, because that's all that they do. But meanwhile, the public see the incompetence. And then when something like Kate Bingham comes along, who I agree with you, I think is quite respected, and writes a book excoriating the lot of them, they ought to sit up and listen. Uh, Just as we go to the break then, just to wrap this up, the challenge now for the Conservative Party is that Liz Truss, they will be beginning to feel, many MPs that are contacting me feel that she's finished. There is no way at all that you can come back from being 30 points behind. There's no way that you can come back from what she has done or what she's seen to have done to people's mortgages. And therefore, they face a very stark choice. Do they try to do a leadership toppling again, which is they will be very embarrassed by, it's going to look ridiculous having a third leader in five years? Or are they going to try to stick with her? And I think... (laughs) Rory, it'll be a three leader. It'll be a third leader in five months. That's unbelievable. So three leader in five (laughs) months. You're quite right. Five months, yeah. But I think increasing numbers of people are reaching out to me feel that actually they have to get rid of less trust for two reasons. Firstly, that the only hope of reassuring the markets, they feel, is to bring in somebody who has some credibility and That might be somebody like Rishi Sunak, who at least was more cautious and prudent during the leadership campaign. But they also feel that just, and this is Charles Walker has been saying this, that just in the national interest, they need to start restoring the finances and hand over something decent, even if they're handing over to a Labour government. And I think both those things will drive people to increasingly turn against her. Uh, there There was an excoriating piece about trust by Camilla Cavendish in the Financial Times. And I think it was in that piece that it was pointed out that those who are sort of saying, oh, this shows we should never have got rid of Johnson, two things. I think Johnson actually, I think trust is almost like a tipping point, but it, a lot of this is about the, what Johnson's done to the Tory party and what he's done to the country. And the second thing to say is that, this is a point Dominic Cummings has made, is that Johnson backed trust partly because he hoped that this would happen and that that would be his way back in. So I think, I think Johnson, anybody who thinks Johnson is the answer to their problems is, is utterly misguided. Anyway, Good. should we take a break? Okay, thank you very much. Look forward to speaking after the break. Welcome back to The Rest is Politics with me, Rory Stewart. And me, Alistair Campbell. Um, and it's the SNP conference this week, Rory, and Nicola Sturgeon getting a bit of stick from our friend Nadine the Egg Zahawi for saying that she detests Tories. Well, that's part of the culture of the left, isn't it? I mean, it's something I've always found very, very... Oh, you see her as a left winner? Yes, she is very much. Nicola's very much on the left. And, and I, I mean, it's, it's, it's actually something I always find... One of the things I find a bit shocking about left-wing politics is this thing that we've talked about in the past, which is that Conservative Party tends to think that people on the left are wrong, whereas people on the left tend to think conservatives are literally evil. But hold on, you have called Boris Johnson evil. Yeah, but they, that's not because he's a conservative. It's because he's a morally reprehensible human being. That's, that's right. nothing to do with his political party. And I'm very, very happy to call people on the left evil too. I, there are evil but, people, but, I don't, but, but what's different about the left is that a massive lack of empathy and understanding, and it's actually been documented in scientific studies in the United States that Democratic voters are almost incapable of understanding why anyone would ever vote Republican. They actually, if you ask them questions like, do you think Republicans favor cruelty to animals? They're like, yes, I'm sure they do. They project the most incredibly vicious, negative visions on right-wing voters and right-wing politicians. <laughs> I think you're picking the wrong country there, Rory. I mean, the, the right-wing Republicans, I mean, they, there, is, there is no good that Joe Biden can do. Waking up every morning is a terrible thing to do. But uh, I get what she was saying, though, because if I look at, we mentioned Suella Braverman and the Rwanda flight thing. I don't know Suella Braverman well enough to, to, to detest or not to detest, but I detest that sort of worldview and that, so that that is the motivation for her to be in politics. I detest the, their acceptance of homelessness and their acceptance of the shocking lack of provision for mental 
mental health service. I, I detest these things. It doesn't mean that there aren't conservatives that I that I like and I can get on with, but I kind of get what she was saying. Well, it's, it's firstly, I, I interviewed a Labour MP on the on the BBC when I was talking about empathy and different views of parties, and it, it was really interesting. I, I said to, I said to her. You know, one of the problems is the left finds it difficult to empathize with the right. And she says, what, because they're, they're evil and they just hate immigrants. <laughs> and I said, no, no, I, I'm, I'm trying to suggest. And she then said, I, I, don't, I don't get what you're saying. The left is just right. The right is just wrong. And she just couldn't get out. I mean, she's a sitting Labour MP, just simply incapable mm. of, it's part of the thing that we've talked about in the past, which is the assumption that austerity was a deliberate attempt of cruelty and damage rather than an attempt to balance the budget rather than a perfectly valid argument about you know, the deficit and but, debt. But just say something like that. I mean, I, I can't remember the exact figure, but there was a, a report came out recently. The deaths that were attributed, the premature deaths attributed to austerity were in the hundreds of thousands. Now, I'm not saying that I'm not saying it was deliberate, but I'm saying that, you know, those who continue to defend austerity, Rory, would rather talk, as you do, only about the kind of economics data attached to that rather than those real life consequences. Now, I don't see that as left right. What are these hundreds of thousands of deaths, Alistair? And what are the hundreds of thousands of deaths? What does that mean, the hundreds of thousands of deaths? I mean, in practice, because people keep well, saying the Tories killed hundreds of thousands of people. No, I didn't and, and say when that. No, I didn't say that. When, when, people, was... when people say that, it basically sounds like, and I've seen it on Labour literature, basically sounds like you're accusing the Tories of perpetrating some kind of genocide. What does it actually no, mean? That's nonsense. That's nonsense. The, last, the last time I read about it, I haven't read, I'll be honest, I haven't read the report. I read Gordon Brown writing about it the other day where he was quoting a report which said that the effects of austerity would, ha, had been directly linked to premature death um, of, three, I think it was 335,000 people. Now, this, so the short answer is, I don't know, okay? But I think that, you know, you just have to look at um, the longevity rates as they, according to class. You just have to look at regional variations in the same thing. In fact, Sajid Javid, here I'm going to say something nice about a Tory. Sajid Javid did a very moving interview this morning about his brother's suicide and the need to talk about suicide and strip away the taboo and so forth. Um, and he then went on to say that the government had failed on mental health provision and the government had, had failed over the four years they've been talking about the online harms bill and still nothing's happened. Now, I'm not saying the people who have not delivered that are thinking, right, let's do that so that more people like Molly Russell kill themselves. But you can make that link and I think that on austerity, I, I just think that something like austerity, which I do think it was a political choice. It was a political choice. And it was a political choice, which should be much more understandable now that we see what happens when you don't get your borrowing and deficit policies right. All the, all the, all the labor arguments at the time were that it was completely unnecessary, that we could continue to borrow and spend more. No, the, arguments were, the, the arguments, I, I, I heard them say in the House of Commons again and again, they were saying that the Conservatives were putting too much focus on market sentiment. They were being too cautious about what would happen to currency and bond markets, that it wasn't true that the deficit needed to be reduced, that we were in an environment of low interest rates where it was possible to keep borrowing no, almost you're indefinitely. Doing, you're doing exactly what I said, that the, what I was suggesting was not the right way to approach this. And you, you're, you're going through all the economic data. Fine, it's important. But I think particularly now, as we are clearly, if less trust survives, heading into austerity with absolute booster rockets on, not least because of the catastrophic mistakes that they've made, then I think we do have to think about whether there is something that's gone deeply, deeply wrong in the values at the heart of the Conservative Party. And I think that's what Nicola Sturgeon was reflecting. I suspect she wishes she hadn't said it. I suspect she wishes now I she don't just think, said I don't think she wishes that at all. I think, I, I think it resonates probably with the majority of the listeners on this podcast. I think people on the left think that. They think that no, the Tory no, party is evil. I think, you're, you're being too, I think you're being too sort of um, definitive about this. I, I said earlier, I don't detest people because they are Tories. I don't. But I detest a lot of what the Tories have done historically, and I particularly detest what they're doing now across all sorts of areas. And I, the, reason why, the reason why I think she might regret it is because Look, we're talking about the, the SNP conference in relation to this and the Tories. Maybe she wants that. Maybe she doesn't want to ever be talking about independence again. But I suspect that's not the case. But I think what she was trying to say 
is that she de- she detests what the Tories do. And I think when you look, when I looked at that conference last week, I just this a lot, I found a lot of it detestable. I must say, I really so, did. So, so the challenge to come back to practical stuff is what's the Labour policy going to be? So it's all very well Labour saying they don't believe in trying to cut spending. So what are they going to do? How much are they going to spend? What are they going to spend it on? Because the question from 2010 to 2018, coming out of 2008, coming out with that debt burden, coming out with a deficit of 140 billion a year, Mm. what are you going to do? And I fear that many, many people listening to this podcast and many people who opposed it did not have a credible alternative policy. They somehow assumed that we could just keep borrowing and keep spending. And what I would like to see from Labour is some assessment of what are they going to do? So presumably they're going to put taxes up to bounce budget. Is that what you can do? Put the taxes up much higher? Well, when you say, what are you going to do? Remember, I'm not a member of the Labour Party. However, I am a passionate Labour supporter and I desperately want the Labour Party to win the next election because I think we've had 12 years of the country achieving next to nothing. Look, the, the Labour, it was obvious from the, the event at, uh, at Blackpool that when I think it was a pretty pro-Labour audience, I think that I got that sense. But when you asked the question about, for example, whether people thought that Keir Starmer was boring, you know, quite a few hands went up, not a far from a majority, but a, you know, a sort of noticeable minority of hands went up. And I, I hear all the time from people, I heard it get in the swimming pool this morning, somebody say, you know, I just, I want more from them. I want to hear more about what they're going to do. Now, I go back to the point I've made before. I think Keir is, is going through stages. He's done and is continuing to do the kind of decontamination stage. He's done the let's expose the Tories as being unfit to govern, in particular Johnson. He's got rid of him. And now we've got Trust, who I think he'll probably see off as well. And then it's about the the positive agenda. And I thought a big step on that was this green energy proposal that he put into his con- there was a centerpiece of the conference speech. I'd like to see more of that. And then I think come a general election, you have to set out the policy in full. And I'm hoping it will be full of new ideas about how you build a modern economy, at which the environment agenda will be a big part. I hope there'll be a big program of constitutional reform and constitutional change. I hope we'll finally get education and skills back on the agenda. I think there's all sorts of things that Labour can do. I'm with you. I'm with you. And I'd like to see all of those things. But the fundamental problem is that we are borrowing an incredible amount of money. Prices are soaring. Interest rates are rising. Uh, He proposed the energy price cap, which is going to cost the government 150 to 160 billion, which Liz Truss mm-hmm. signed up to. So he would have been spending 150, 160 billion on that. I cannot see where the revenue is coming in at the other end to balance the budget. And one of the things that Tony Blair did, and one of the things he won in 97, is he gave the impression of being able to balance the budget, he gave the impression of fiscal responsibility. And you remember Gordon Brown kept setting these fiscal rules. What I'm not seeing from Keir Starmer at the moment is where that vision of balancing the budget's coming from. Because what I fear he's going to be tempted to do is he'll be under huge pressure to spend more on almost everything. Because obviously, voters who oppose the Conservative Party have spent 12 years thinking there's been too much restraint on public spending. Mm. So he will come in with a huge constituency wanting to raise salaries for public sector workers, wanting to spend far more on education, far more on health, far more on yep. welfare. Absolutely. And where's, where's he going to get the money from? Well, but but I actually think if you were to look at recent speeches of Rachel Reeves, the Shadow Chancellor, and Kwasi Kwarteng, and I'm not saying you're going to get every answer to the questions that you pose from Labour, but what, what I think you do get is a, a far tougher message in answer to those questions than you're getting from Liz Truss, who I think is has found the, the so-called magic money tree. So, look, they are going to have to come up with these answers. I think they're being quite sassy in not being pushed into a position where the Tories and the Tory press will want them, where they get treated as though they are the government before you get anywhere near a general election. We're still some way off. If you think, for example, what was the big message of Liz Truss's speech? What was the sort of killer soundbite she wanted out of it? Ask me my three priorities for government, and I'll tell you growth, 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 which was a direct lift from a Keir Starmer speech of a few weeks earlier. So they will be thinking, think as well that they've got to maybe 
hold back. But I, look, we're not disagreeing here because I think you want them to have all the answers. I want them to be more radical and to have more, you know, more kind of show more leg in terms of what they are going to do that's different to the Conservatives. And I think the argument they're having is the pace and the timing. Well, maybe just to, to wrap this one up, I think the the challenge of people taking an office, regardless of what you think about the way that David Cameron did economics, is that there's a trilemma. You can balance the books, you can hold down taxes, or you can increase funding for public services. Right? You can do two of the three, but you can't do all three at once. They're not going to be able to balance the books, hold down taxes for most people, and adequately fund public services. And so I think that's going to be the, the question going forward. And, and that, of course, is the question that's been at the center of British politics for 70 years. Mm. What's changed is that the Conservative Party, nobody ever thought they were nice, but they thought they were relatively competent and that they were serious about controlling spending. What Liz Truss has done is blown that credibility. So what she's done is so much more damaging to the Conservative Party, mm. I'm afraid in the long run, than austerity or any of those choices, because those things will have been read by people as tough decisions, but decisions made by people who had a theory mm -hmm. and were trying to be fiscally responsible. What she's done is she's taken away the one argument the Conservatives had, which was that they were supposed to be able to balance the books. It's an argument, by the way, I, I think that this sort of, you know, one of the many overhangs of having such a biased right-wing media is that this idea that the Conservatives historically have been great on the economy is absolute nonsense. You know, Mrs. Thatcher's record, she spaffed the North Sea oil. That I don't think actually Cameron's record in the economy is strong, likewise Ted Heath. And this thing about growth, you know, let me just say the new Labour record on growth are way better than the last 12 years. So that's something, that, again, which Labour has not fought back on enough because we like to be seen as the party of public services. And that has helped the Tories present themselves as the party of economic prudence. Yeah, yeah. And all that. Anyway, yeah. The one thing we haven't discussed yeah. in this is whether, and this goes back to the whole thing, we had quite a lot of questions this week about this sort of donut e economics idea and whether actually... A politician and a political party needs to come along and say, look, let's stop banging on about growth because all growth means is using up more finite resources. It means carrying on with the whole population boom. And actually, we need to come at this from a very different angle. But I suspect that's probably for another day. Yeah. Well, I mean, let's talk about another day. It's a really, really good question because obviously in the long run, growth is kind of mad. I mean, in the long run, if you compound at 2% growth for the next few thousand years, the world economy would grow by you know, 10,000 fold. Mm. which would be a sort of impossible vision of energy mm. and resource use. So it isn't compatible to try to keep growth at the current rate and achieve any of our environmental or climate objectives. That's definitely true over 50 years. It's even more true over 400, 500 years. But, but if one of the main political parties came along and said that in the next election, what would the outcome be, do you think? Catastrophic. And, and this, this is where there is a real, really interesting tension between what voters understand, what voters believe is possible, and what may actually be the logical right thing to do. I think it's the hard mm. right thing. Um, one other kick at Liz Truss, because... Go on. Now, one of the things I'm really disturbed by at the moment is her proposal to move the British embassy in Israel to Jerusalem. Right? This is uh, something which Trump did, but apart from Trump, it's only Kosovo, Guatemala, and Honduras that have done yeah. that, because yeah. Jerusalem is an international city, was since forty nine. East Jerusalem is considered to be part of the occupied Palestinian territories. And although Israel uses Jerusalem as its de facto capital, that's where the parliament is, that's where the Supreme Court is, the United Nations and the overwhelming majority of countries in the world continue to keep their embassies in Tel Aviv because they do not want to de facto recognize Israel's occupation of East Jerusalem. And this goes against endless UN resolutions. And it's a very, very disruptive, radical choice for Liz Truss to make. Do you know something that crossed my mind when I was reading about this the other day? I don't know anything really about Liz Truss's family background, but I do know that her dad was a, is a left-wing academic. And I just wonder if there's something playing out that she's sort of picking on issues that she knows will provoke people on the left in particular. And this one, you know, we're back to the Millwall thing. Who is she trying to please and who is she trying to upset? She said in the leadership election that she's a huge Zionist and a huge supporter of Israel. Well, fine. But she's also, she also knew at the time that she would be the prime minister if she won. And the British government has played its part in varying degrees of success at varying stages of recent history. 
and given we have a lot of responsibility to how this whole thing is set up in the first place, playing its part in trying to bring peace around a two-state solution. And she knows, surely, that this kind of lobs a bit of a grenade into that. I was pleased to see that Justin Welby, the Archbishop, you looked very upset at Blackpool when I said he was my favourite old Etonian, but it was just a, I was just trying to get a laugh, Rory. Oh, thank you. He said he was concerned about the potential impact of moving the embassy in Israel from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem before a negotiated settlement between Palestinians and Israelis has been re- reached. He's in touch with Christian leaders in the Holy Land and continues to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And likewise, Cardinal Vincent Nichols, who's the Archbishop of Westminster, said such a re- relocation of the embassy would be seriously damaging to any possibility of lasting peace in the region and the international reputation of the United Kingdom. Pope Francis and the leaders of the churches in the Holy Land have long called for the international status quo in Jerusalem to be upheld in accordance with the relevant UN resolutions. So she's brought together the, um, the various wings of our, of our churches, Catholic and Anglican alike. And what is she doing it for? And it was it, all it, part it, of this... Is, is it like Trump that she's trying this populist technique of throwing dead cats on tables and trying to provoke people by just saying radical things to grab attention? I mean, that's, that's why Trump did it, isn't it? Yeah, and Trump did do it. I mean, the, the, yeah. the thing about the dead cat is often it's about putting stories out there that then nothing ever happens. And I think I'm right that I, did I see Tony Blinken is talking about reopening the U.S. consulate yeah, in, in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Yeah, yeah which, which had been the de-, de facto embassy for Palestinians. Um, but I think it's, it's, it goes back to the thing about Northern Ireland. It's like, don't, you know, just th- appeal to who the, the people that you're trying to appeal to, a very narrow sect in your party, rather than think through the consequences of what you're saying. So I share your concern on this one. Well, uh, good or better news, I think, now in Northern Ireland. It looks as though Liz Trust is finally being more pragmatic, working more closely with the Republic of Ireland and the United States, there seems to be more movement towards some kind of settlement on that issue, which is a real relief because that was really being stoked up. Well, I do hope so, but it's, it's all going to be in the detail, isn't it? And we've got Mr. Steve Baker out there who, you know, may be trying to sort of project himself as a nice, cuddly, softer person, but he is the ERG who pushed them into this hardline position in the first place. Now, what about Libya? You want to talk about Libya? Yeah, yeah, they've gone then, just as we wrap up, because like, people have been listening for a long time. But I'm in North Africa at the moment. I'm in Morocco, talking to you from Marrakesh, down a dodgy internet connection. And Libya is an amazing thing. So it's just over 10 years since the intervention in Libya. I remember driving into Tripoli just the day that Gaddafi fell. Militias all over the streets, guys with heavy machine guns on the back of pickup trucks, but huge optimism. David Cameron, Barack Obama... Uh, Nicolas Sarkozy had got together to do this intervention in Libya. And it was the breaking of a lot of things. I think we'll go back in history and we'll see that moment as a very, very important moment in what went wrong in the, I guess, the kind of liberal Western international coalition. First thing is that, as we've discussed in the podcast before, China and Russia, very unusually on the Security Council, initially supported taking action against Gaddafi and Benghazi. And then the West got carried away and they pushed ahead with an intervention which had not been authorized by China or Russia. So that was a big breaking point. There was huge optimism, of course, about elections in the normal way, people running around with purple fingers. And then the whole thing began to break apart. And for the last few years, there's been a de facto split in the country between the East, which is run by a very sinister man who calls himself Field Marshal Hiftar, who's backed by Egypt and the United Arab Emirates and by the Russians who've been sending in the Wagner Group that we've talked about on this show, this is these very, very sinister mercenaries who are now very active in Ukraine, but also very active in the Central African Republic and Burkina Faso. So 1,500 Russian nationals deployed. He also brought in, and this is something like a sort of 1970s Frederick Forsyth novel. He brought in ex-British Marines. He brought in American Special Forces. They got a helicopters out of Botswana on false papers. They drove boats across from Malta. And against them, on the Western side, the government in Tripoli, which is backed by the Turks. And the Turks then started sending in Syrian fighters, so people who'd been on the Turkish side in the Syrian civil war were floated into Libya. And we've been back and forth over the last few years, UN peace, followed by stalemate, followed by war, peace, stalemate, war, peace, stalemate, war. There were meant to be elections at the end of December, been a fragile peace for the last few months. But, you know, there were another 35 people killed just a couple of weeks ago in Tripoli with fights between them. And the whole thing is now basically run by militia groups. And as a proxy war, 
which feels like something out of the 19th century. The Turks are partly backing this government in Western Turkey because they've got all the mineral concessions along the coast. So you've got it all. You've got minerals, you've got Turkey against UAE, you've got Russian mercenaries, British mercenaries. Well, the other, the, 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 I mean, we, so much of, you know, recently, so much of uh, what we've talked about in the whole geopolitical space relates to to energy. And there's this, I don't know if you've been following this big issue going on at the moment over the Turks and the Libyans, the, the outgoing government of national unity, as it's called, signing this energy <clears throat> energy exploration agreement, which has upset the Egyptians, upset the Greeks, upset the French, upset the Germans, because of course the government, the government of national unity was essentially selected via a, a UN mechanism to as part of the roadmap that's meant to end in elections, but they're not supposed to be signing agreements or memoranda, and the Turks know that. And so that is going to let the Turks, if it goes ahead, explore for hydrocarbon and oil, inside Libyan waters. And the, this all happening while the electoral process, as you say, seems to have, seems to have dried up. Yeah, well, I, I think tricky. And your theme on energy, again, is now provoking a confrontation between Israel and Hezbollah. So the Karish gas field. And again, yeah. the French have been involved. The Greeks have been involved. It's about sharing gas and offshore waters disputed between Lebanon and Israel. Uh, it's partly about getting off dependency on, on Russia. So Russia, Ukraine is playing straight into Israel, Hezbollah conflict at the moment. Egypt is currently totally shaken by the fact that it gets 60% of its wheat from Russia, Ukraine. It's been shattered by the collapse in global trade, the collapse in tourism, and is trying to depend on $22 billion coming in from the Gulf, but its food and gas prices are going crazy. The strong dollar is killing it. So it's amazing the way in which we can see conflicts from Russia, Ukraine, over energy spilling right the way across the region now. Um, yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit about Ukraine and Russia, just as we come well, to an end? I, think, I, I mean, look, today we're, we're recording this on, on Monday, and you're seeing an absolute escalation of the direct attacks. We're back to really heavy, and according to those people who are there on the ground, much heavier even when the earlier uh, missile attacks were at their peak on the Ukraine capital of Kyiv and this is being seen as a direct response to the blowing up of the bridge linking uh, Russia to Crimea. And of course, if you remember that bridge, hugely symbolic for Putin, incredibly important. I think I'm right in remembering that he actually drove a truck. He himself, he loves getting dressed up and sort of being action man. He drove a truck across that bridge. He formally opened it, a sort of symbolic sign that, uh, that the annexation is is more than just an annexation. You now have Ukrainians who were, the, the celebrations across um, Ukraine at the thing going up were enormous. There was a, this amazing piece of artwork that was Im immediately produced and people having pictures of themselves in front of it. And lots of dropped hints from Ukrainian special forces that they'd done it, but no official confirmation, no acceptance of it. And now they're saying that maybe the Russians did it themselves or it's part of the kind of, you know, divisions going on inside Russia. And as ever, I'm afraid when Putin's at the heart of it. You can't quite really establish the truth of what's gone on, but there's no doubt at all. One imagines they didn't quite do it. So, I mean, that's a little bit, particularly since, particularly since the Ukrainians, I think, seem to have printed a stamp commemorating them. I know, but, but, the, <laughs> but this morning, the, one of the, some of the Ukrainians this morning, including somebody who who's, who's works for Zelensky, sort of basically trying to leave that impression that maybe all the divisions going on inside Russia. So it's one of those situations where whatever the, the background to it, Putin has taken it as, a, as a, an excuse, if you like, to ramp up the attacks. And I think we are now moving into a, a, more, a new and more dangerous phase. Um, I suppose the only good news is that he whacked off what he whacked off rather than a tactical nuclear weapon. But then again, you could argue that if he keeps going with, at this intensity, and he'll be hanging on. You made the point at Blackpool, Rory. You said that, you know, historically, whether you think about Napoleon, you think about Hitler, the Russians get involved in lots of wars where they have massive setbacks and lots of loss of life, but they do have a, a kind of reputation for just keeping going. And he'll also be hoping, no doubt, that um, Trump gets the nomination for the Republicans and that Trump comes back because then I think the whole game changes again. Yeah. 
just a final thing, maybe on a happier note after all that sort of very troubling vision. Um, there's a, an amazing new winner of the Arab Fiction Prize, youngest ever winner, and first Libyan, because we were talking about Libyans, and who's written a novel called Bread on Uncle Milad's Table, which has a lovely line, my relationship with bread is long and troubled, just like my relationship with writing. So he's called Mohammed El Nas. And for followers of the rest of politics, I've just tweeted out a little link. So anybody interested in reading some fantastic young Libyan literature? Very good. Very good indeed. And we've, we've got good feedback every time we've plugged books on here that they have little spikes on Amazon. So let's hope for a spike, a spike <laughs> on Amazon for the, well, which prize was it? Mohammed El Nas. And it's the, it's the IPAF's Arabic Fiction Prize. And it's called Bread on Uncle Milad's Table. And we should probably also note that the Nobel Peace Prize has gone to groups in Ukraine, Belarus, and elsewhere who've been campaigning against Putin's invasion. Exactly, including the amazing memorial, which is an extraordinary Russian human rights group shut down by, by Putin at the beginning of this conflict. Um, and I think the producers want us to remind people that there are other booksellers also out there, apart from Amazon. Have a great day. Speak soon. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs> 